everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the next two videos are potentially cases that are connected and I decided specifically not to put them in one video together. Um, I've done something like that before with the Enrique Rios and Elijah Moore case but theirs did end up being connected and authorities did think they were connected. These two are kind of questionable, so I'm totally separating them, giving them their own space, giving them their own story on my platform, and then I'm going to let you guys decide what you think. I don't think it would necessarily benefit these cases to lump them together automatically um, and just right off the bat assume they are. I think we need to take them each for what they are and then see what we think. So today's video is on Elijah Bear Diaz and he definitely only went by Bear. Apparently some of his really close friends and even some of his distant family members had no idea his real name was Elijah so I might accidentally switch it up back and forth because just in researching I saw both used um, over and over again in different ways so Bear was 20 years old he had just turned 20 years old when he disappeared on August 29th 2015 from El Cajon California just east of San Diego now Bear had a very interesting and rather difficult life growing up and it's not necessarily what we normally see in my videos um, but in completely different ways so elijah's mother had left his father when he was only four years old and she moved them back to where she grew up in the barona tribe reservation right outside of san diego so he was a member of the barona tribe so while having your parents separate is an incredibly difficult thing to deal with and it will absolutely normally rock your world he was hit with another life-changing event just two years later so at the age of six years old bear started exhibiting some abnormal health issues so he would be very lethargic and he was only six years old kids his age would be running around and playing and doing everything they possibly can if you know six-year-olds they don't calm down but he didn't want to play as much and he was always a little bit more tired and always kind of just wanted to sit back and relax but then it started gradually getting worse to the point where he started having fevers for weeks at a time and then he started having very unexplained vomiting and at this point his mom Leilani decided this is not normal I need to take my son in and thank goodness she did because when he got to the hospital he was in critical condition and they were surprised that he was not in a coma. It turned out that Bear was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes juvenile diabetes so as a little kid and I think normal levels for blood sugars range anywhere from 90 to I think it's like 140 but his if I'm not mistaken were in the 800s but while he got lucky this time he would spend the rest of his life battling with his diabetes it's already difficult to suffer from a chronic illness that you know is never going to go away. It's not really treatable, it's just manageable. But as a kid, it almost affects you differently because you see other kids going out and having fun and doing all these things, but a bear always had to come inside three times a day and check his blood sugars three times a day. He had to give himself insulin. Some days he felt terrible and couldn't even go and play. Some days he felt great. It's not like he could really find a way to cope because it was so up and down, quite literally, um, that he just had to take it day by day, hour by hour. And as a kid, you don't normally think about things like that. So it started to also affect his mental health and he started struggling a lot with depression. Bear would spend weeks in the hospital multiple times a year and then when he was 17 years old, there was a time period where he spent five months in the hospital. So while he did manage his diabetes as best he could, he still struggled with it. I think he took two different types of insulin mixed together in order to control his diabetes. So it was something that wasn't as easy as just checking and then insulin. It was like his body just seemed to be fighting off any possible form of help. 
Despite having all these health issues, Bear really tried to have the best, most normal life he possibly could and he would push himself a lot and he would go out and explore the reservation and he did make some great friends that supported him and knew that he had this illness and they helped him cope with it and they learned how to manage it and they learned how to be his friend despite the fact that he was held back a lot. And that was absolutely great, but when he was 20 years old, he was at a point where he needed a big change. Bear really had been held back most of his life by his illness, and at this point, at 20 years old, he was ready to go out. He wanted to explore. He wanted to be closer into town because on the Barona Reservation, there wasn't really much there. So if he wanted to go see his friends, if he wanted to go out to stores, he had to drive all the way into town, which was difficult for him, again because of his health. So he decided that he would go ahead and buy a house in town. So I found it interesting learning this, but on the Barona Reservation they have a casino and they basically take all the earnings from this casino and they split it up between all of the tribe members. And I think that's an absolutely brilliant idea. Like I was blown away by this. I think it's so incredibly great. I wish more people did something like this. But basically adults would have a check written to them every single month for their portion of the earnings and then kids would actually have all that money put into a trust fund. So by the time you can get your trust fund, you've got a decent amount of money saved up and you can really set yourself up for success. So he was actually able to take this trust fund and completely buy a house flat out at the age of 20 and this was so incredibly exciting for him. And then on top of that, he would continuously get payments from the reservation now that he was an adult. He was set up pretty well and as soon as he moved into this house, he went off with his newfound freedom and he bought TVs, he bought gaming systems, he bought cars, he bought everything he possibly could and he started going out to a local hookah lounge and really made a ton of new friends. Now, he was, I think, feeling like he was lacking in an area when it came to physically being able to do certain things and I think he felt he needed to make up for that when it came to making friends and maybe impressing them. On top of that, he was just a really warm and giving person. So he would normally buy things for his friends or if they needed to um, come over and stay somewhere, he would always have his door open so people could come and just hang out on his couch. He was always throwing parties for people. It was like this revolving door in his home of just dozens of people that he had met at the hookah lounge. They didn't even have to be someone he knew very well. Basically, if he met you and you talked to him, you were his friend, you were allowed to have the benefits that everyone else did and he really didn't put much of a limit on this. He was having an absolutely amazing time, but unfortunately, this newfound freedom was cut short when his health declined yet again in a very, very serious way. It got to the point where Bear could no longer keep up with the lifestyle that he had created, and his mother had to come and essentially be his caretaker. She was there for five to eight hours a day. He had wounds on his feet from neuropathy because of his diabetes and he had to use either crutches or a wheelchair to get around. Those new cars he bought himself, he couldn't drive them. This new house that he had for himself, he could barely get around it on his own. He was getting to the point where he was so weak that he could barely hold himself up. He was severely, severely underweight and I think only around 100 pounds. He needed his mother to be there and because of his health and how often he had to stay in bed because he just couldn't get up. It was to the point where his feet would have needed to be amputated if they didn't heal and his cataracts were so bad that he was almost to the point of being blind. His health just seemed to be spinning out of control and unfortunately this started to affect his mental health. So the day Bear disappeared was a Saturday and majority of his family that day had been together for a funeral. But unfortunately, Bear didn't have the option to go to the funeral because he was so weak and he could barely get around. So he had to see his whole family go to this very important event to say goodbye to a loved one and he couldn't be there. 
After the funeral, his mom, Leilani, called him and said, hey, you know, I'm gonna come and get you. We're gonna hang out. I know you couldn't be here today, but you know, she didn't want him to feel secluded and alone, so she came to pick him up, but realized he was in a very, very agitated mood. He was not happy, likely because, yet again, he felt like he was missing out on something. He couldn't even go to a funeral. And it seemed to be affecting him very badly to the point where she ended up having to just take him home at his own request because he just couldn't deal with anything. There were kids that were playing in the home too much when she took him back to the family. He couldn't handle the screaming. He was yelling at people. He just wasn't in a good spot. So when they got home at around 10 p.m., she started having a conversation with Bear, saying there's stuff you can still look forward to. You can go to school, you can learn, you can get your mind focused on something that helps you grow because she knew he couldn't just sit around and you know, wallow in this illness and how bad he felt and how bad he felt for himself and how unfair it was that he couldn't do things that he just so desperately wanted to do. And she hoped this would show that there is a little bit of hope, but instead it just angered him even more. And it started a very heated conversation Bear ended up just yelling and screaming at his mom and saying, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what it's like to feel this way. I'm alone. I have nobody. I can't have a normal life. I can't have normal friends. And Leilani decided that at this point, he just really needed to be by himself. He needed time to cool off, that what she was saying was just angering him more. So at around 10.30 p.m. that night, she left and she told Bear she would be back the next day, as she always was, to bring him lunch and then she'd be with him for the rest of the day. So she left and at around 11, 19 p.m. she texted Bear and said, I've made it home safe. And he responded, okay, I'm glad, I love you. But unfortunately, this would be the very last time Leilani would speak to her son. The next morning, Leilani started texting Bear and asking him how he was, asking him what he wanted for lunch, and she didn't receive any response, which at first was not alarming to her. She knew they had a little argument the night before and assumed he maybe just needed some space. So she waited a while and no response. So then she started texting him again and said, you know, are you still mad at me? Do you want me to come over today? Do you not want me to come over? And again, no response. So at this point, she knew he needed to eat. She knew he needed someone with him so she headed to his house at around 4 p.m. when she arrived his car was there obviously he could not drive it on his own but she assumed this at least meant that none of his friends had taken him out and that's why he wasn't responding so she goes into the house and sees that his door is shut and locked and she assumed maybe he just stayed up all night playing and gaming and hanging out with some friends to cool off and he was just sleeping. So she tried to call out for him a few times, received yet again no response, so she finally opened his door to find that Bear wasn't in his room. So immediate panic set in for Leilani because she knew his mental state was not great, his health was not great, and the thought crossed her mind that maybe he had hurt himself or potentially ended his life, which was very fresh on her mind because just a year before, Bear's brother and her stepson ended his own life and it absolutely shook the entire family. So she panicked and started running around every single room, checked every bathroom, bathtub, closet, crack and crevice, everything she possibly could, hoping that when she looked, she wouldn't find Bear's lifeless body, and she didn't. But then this brought up another question, where did Bear go on his own? He couldn't go anywhere without help. But then she started really noticing some things around his bedroom in particular that seemed a little bit strange to her. His sheets had been taken off the bed. I'm talking fitted sheet and everything. But his comforter and his pillows had been thrown off the bed beside it. That made absolutely no sense. She also looked around and his 50 inch flat screen TV was gone. His safe had been opened and I think about 7,000 plus dollars was gone from it. His backpack where he had about two to three weeks of insulin was gone and his crutches were gone, but he had left his glasses that he desperately needed to see and he had left things like toothbrushes, um, his phone charger, there was a single glove and a single sandal that were missing. It was a very bizarre 
situation. She went to look through the rest of the house to see if there was anything else missing and see if there were any clues left behind as to where Bear might have gone because at this point now she knows he likely didn't end his life in the house. She can't find him anywhere. So because of the things that were missing, she assumed maybe he just packed up real quick and took off for a little bit of time for himself to clear his head. She goes into the kitchen and finds one of Bear's roommates and asks, you know, have you seen him? What's going on? Did he tell you where he was going? Is there anything that you can give me that will lead me to him or lead me to understand what's happening? And the roommate was just as confused as she was. He had apparently come home at around 2.30 a.m early early that morning so just a few hours after Leilani had dropped Bear off and he said when he got home there wasn't really any sign of forced entry anywhere and Bear's door was shut just like it was when she arrived so he assumed Bear had been sleeping then and Bear was just sleeping in late because he didn't feel well he had no idea Bear hadn't been in his room this entire time and he never saw Bear leave Bear never told him anything so at this point Bear just disappeared without out saying anything to anybody. Leilani tried so incredibly hard not to panic despite the fact that they had been in this giant argument the night before and he was struggling to cope with his illness and his mental health and she assumed you know take a deep breath think about all the possibilities think about when he would come back and she realized that he had a bunch of doctor's appointments lined up for the following day which was Monday, and she knew Bear would never miss any of those doctor's appointments. He needed them to feel better. He went to a chiropractor, he went to doctors for different medicines, and she knew there's no way that even if he went to take a break, he wouldn't come back for those. So the next day, she went and sat out front of every single doctor's appointment, but Bear didn't show up to a single one. At this point, Leilani knew it was just time to file him as a missing person. So she went and called, and unfortunately, they told her what they tell most moms who are missing young adults, and that's that he has a right to go missing. They agreed to jot down his name and information, and they would put a report in, but technically, they couldn't do much of anything. They were bound by the fact that if he wanted to leave, he could, and that's that. She started going through more things in her mind that, you know, he had two to three weeks of medicine in that backpack. For sure he would come home by then. He had a powwow that upcoming weekend, and that's something he would never miss. He for sure would come home by then. She started contacting every friend that she knew he had, which was proving to be very difficult because he had made so many different friends when he moved at this new hookah lounge, and she didn't know some of them. He barely even knew some of them. And she was hoping that maybe one of them had helped him go somewhere because again he was by all means disabled you know he could not do things on his own he essentially required a caregiver based on his current state of health so someone helped him and she hoped maybe someone will come forward and say hey yeah I took him here or I took him there but unfortunately no one came forward with any sort of information despite her reaching out to dozens of people so then she sat back and waited for the powwow at the Barona reservation she kept her eye out the entire time she was passing out flyers hoping maybe somebody would see him him, but unfortunately Bear never showed up to this either. So things at this point were really starting to add up that made it seem less and less like Bear had just taken some time to himself. At this point it had been a week since anyone had spoken to Bear or seen Bear and this was absolutely not like him. Not only had Bear missed doctor's appointments and the powwow, he hadn't even gone to pick up his check from the casino. And this is when Leilani started wondering if something else happened to him. She had thought that the state of his room was bizarre before, but now it seemed to her that it was actually a potential crime scene. She frantically called authorities once more and begged them for help, and she really used the fact that he was sick and he needed help. And while he was an adult, and yes, legally he could go somewhere, he had type 1 diabetes and he was almost blind, he couldn't walk, he couldn't take care of himself, and he had a very limited supply of medicine and he could die if he wasn't found. So authorities at this point quickly jumped on the case. They knew he had missed appointments, he hadn't told anyone he was leaving, he had missed picking up his paycheck, so it kind of fit more into a missing person, potentially 
in danger scenario. Authorities came to the house and used luminol to check the entire house top to bottom, seeing if there was some sort of crime scene or anything left behind, but unfortunately, they weren't able to find anything. They also searched for any tiny sign of a struggle, but again, nothing. So how did this heavy TV get carried out of the home and why? Bear was extremely underweight and he couldn't have done it himself without any sort of assistance. Also, why would he take his sheets and not just grab a blanket and the pillow off the ground? He would have had to take the sheets and the blanket off the bed and then pulled off the entire sheet. That didn't make a lot of logical sense. And why did he need all of that money? Why would he take his crutches to walk but not take his glasses? You know, why even bother with the crutches if you can't see where you're going? The whole scene just didn't make a lot of sense other than somebody had to have helped him. Authorities started to interview family and friends hoping to get some sort of solid lead because at this point it just was a very bizarre mix of things taken and not taken and not a single person had heard from him. But this investigation was proving to be very difficult for authorities just like it had been for Leilani when she was searching on her own. The forensic search of his house was difficult because so many different people had been over there that there were just too many fingerprints that all could be explainable. He had two full-time roommates and obviously their prints could be matched to things and that was explainable, but he would have up to five people, five random people every single night come in and stay on his couch. The amount of people that came in and out of that home made this investigation so difficult in so many different ways. Out of the friends that they did find and did come forward and claim to know Bear, they weren't getting any information from them anyway. So all of them told authorities that they hadn't heard from him, but that it wasn't uncommon for him to just take off for a week or two. And to them, that's true. Bear would have moments where he would be upset or dealing with a lot of health issues and he would take off for a week or two and they wouldn't know where he was because they were just his friends and barely acquaintances. But what they didn't know is that usually when he took off, he was either with his mother or his mother at least knew where he was going. He always said, hey, I'm having a rough time. I'm going here. He would let her know when he got there, let her know when he would come home. It wasn't like he didn't tell anyone where he was going. So even though it may have seemed normal to his friends, this time it wasn't normal at all. Authorities then went on to his electronic trail to further nail down a timeline because they even had no idea when he had gone missing. His mother had last seen him and spoken to him at 1119 Saturday night and he wasn't really noticed missing until 4 to 5 p.m. the following day. That is a lot of time that they really needed to crunch down to be able to properly investigate. They checked his phone and realized that there was a data dump at 1.29 a.m. A few hours after Leilani dropped him off and last spoke to him and only an hour before his roommate came home. But the thing that was strange is where this data dump happened and the tower the phone was pinging off of and the location it was pinging off of was at the Barona Reservation by the casino. So 29 minutes later, there was another data dump in Santa Isabel. Now, being at the Barona Reservation wasn't necessarily something uncommon for him. But what was uncommon was going to Santa Isabel. Santa Isabel was very far north from his home. So from his home to the reservation to Santa Isabel didn't make a lot of sense in itself because he was just aimlessly going up north and there was no real reason for him to be heading anywhere up north. There's nowhere he normally went up north. So that was strange, but also the area that the phone was pinging off of is barren land, like rural barren land that no one would have any reason to go to at two in the morning. To authorities, this was a very, very ominous sign. This location and this barren side of a mountain would be an ideal place to dump and hide a body. Or if for some reason he decided to go out to this location, the wildlife would present a massive massive 
threat to his safety. After this ping and Santa Isabel in the middle of absolutely nowhere, Elijah's phone went silent along with his bank account and social media. And it had been silent since. So authorities were faced with two possibilities and both required immediate action. Elijah possibly been murdered and dumped on the side of this mountain in Santa Isabel, or had he just been out there alone and attacked by an animal? The animals were so relentless and there was such a high population of them in this area that his body could be spread far and wide and unrecognizable within hours. So they had to start a search immediately. Helicopters were sent out to search in this area that Bear's phone was thought to have last sent off a ping and when they got there, they said it looked as if humans had not even touched this land. And despite hours and hours of searching, they weren't able to find a single thing, which didn't make a lot of sense to authorities because this is where his trail stopped. This had to have been the place where something happened or at least something ended. His last known whereabouts based on his cell phone activity were pretty much the only thing authorities had to go off of because the state of his room, it wasn't clear on whether he ran away or something happened to him. So when the search brought no answers, it seemed like the case came to a screeching halt. His family decided to dive deeper into information, hoping they could gather more tips and leads on their own. And in a bizarre turn of events, they were led straight to another missing man named Skylar Tosic. And this is going to be the next missing persons case that you hear. So Skylar's story, as I said in the beginning, is going to be in a separate video. It is a much smaller, less detailed story, but there are a lot of people who believe that they are potentially connected because Skylar went missing just the day after Bear did, and he only lived about 20 minutes from Bear. Bear and Skylar even looked physically similar, so a lot of people really clung onto the idea that whatever happened to one likely happened to the other, or they were connected in just some way, shape, or form. Skylar was even dropped off only 30 minutes away from where Bear's phone sent off a last ping. So when you hear Skylar's story next week, you can kind of hear his circumstances and see if you think maybe they're possibly connected, see if you can come up with any other theories or maybe you see something that a lot of people have missed. Both mothers of these missing young men really formed a bond because they both were experiencing something that they never thought they would experience in their entire life and they were really connected because of the similarities of both of their sons disappearances and just their sons in general and they worked tirelessly to try to find some sort of connection to possibly locate both of their sons but both women remained empty-handed. At this point, there were no real tips or answers that pointed authorities or the family in any sort of direction, so Bear's family started to organize their own search. They just really got a map together and searched any possible place he could be. And after a few possible sightings of Bear in the area where his biological father lived, his dad then took initiative to start searching near his home as well, even though I think it was like 100 plus miles north. But all of these searches always came up empty-handed they never found the crutches, they never found his backpack, they never found this shoe or this glove, they never found anything. And then in October, there was a potential body found and everybody braced for the absolute worst, even Skylar's mom, because the body was found almost directly in the middle at Lake Hodges between where Skylar went missing and where Bear went missing but it was quickly determined that this body was female, so the family was able to take a big breath of relief, but they still were getting nowhere. Bear and Skylar's mom continued to grow in their relationship and bond and work together. I even think they each volunteered on each other's different searches and caused their own search to help the other search, but despite these similarities in the cases and the relationship that they had created, authorities said that they did not believe these cases were connected and everything that did make them seem similar was just coincidental. The case trucked on and in November of 2015, Leilani became the conservator for Bear's estate and turned his home into the headquarters for his search and desperately hoped one day she would be able to give his home back to him. And then nine months after Bear disappeared, his biological father died suddenly of a heart attack without ever knowing what happened to his son. 
Then in 2016, a billboard was put up in Lakeside on State Route 67, and the Diaz family had a banner hanging outside of their homes that said, Bring Bear Home, and they started a big website in order to keep his face in the public. They even took time to go door to door and remind people that Bear had never come home. They had no tips, but he was out there and people needed to remain vigilant. Since then, everything has come really to a standstill, and the more time that passes, the more likely it is that something has happened to Bear, but without any tips and without any clues left behind, it's been impossible for authorities to piece this puzzle together and figure it out. So now we're going to really talk about the theories, and this is where my mind just feels like mush at this point, because it feels like one of those cases where there's so many giant bits of information that point two very different ways, but then there's this like middle area that's just very gray, and it could go either way, but it also could totally rule out any possibility. It, it's so frustrating. I've been trying so hard to really go through this information and think about different possibilities and rule out what seems less likely, but it's like you could go in circles and circles and circles with this case and just come out more frustrated and more confused and with more questions than when you started off. So I really, really want you guys to take in this information that I've said and think if maybe authorities are missing something, think of your own personal experiences, leave your theories down below because it's just been mind-boggling and frustrating going through everything, not just me as an outsider looking through this information, but for authorities and his family. They can't make sense of so many things that should make sense. The obvious theories are that he ran off, possibly to end his life, or someone did something to him. So he was struggling a lot, and just hours before he ran off, he had been in a massive fight with probably the person that he was closest to in his entire life, and that is his mom. When you are already feeling very alone and upset, something like that could very easily trigger your depression. And, you know, it's like what we've talked about before. It's the straw that broke the camel's back. And he had all this freedom, this new freedom. He had all these new friends, all these new opportunities. And he, he wanted this because he felt like it had been taken away from him because of his illness. So when his illness came back around and laid him on his back again, I'm sure that was devastating for him. And then for him to feel like his mother didn't understand, not that she didn't necessarily, but for him to feel that way and to feel like it had all been taken from him again. And especially, you know, the day before to not even be able to go and have closure at a funeral for one of your family members. Add that to this fight with the one person he was closest to, and I am sure he could have been set off just like that. He could have easily contacted one of the many friends that he had made, and there's a handful that didn't know him very well and probably would have helped him without feeling close enough to the situation to come forward. Um, I think about the TV a lot when I think about this scenario because he easily could have, you know, had a friend over and been like, hey, if you help me get here, you can have my TV and I'll give you some of my cash. So that could explain why the TV was gone and most of his belongings were gone as well. But my issue with this is that if he had contacted someone, you know, to come over or to even help him, authorities would have found that in his phone. So this would have had to have been a perfect coincidence and someone would have had to have come over that would have been willing to do this that night unannounced or without at least speaking to him because authorities would have followed that up. And in that case, that means that tracking this person down or being able to determine who exactly it was is going to be almost impossible if there is no trail left behind or text message or any evidence that they had ever been there that night. If he had planned to end his life, you know, this person would have to have known that. You, you know, they would have had to take him, for instance, to Santa Isabel, where, you know, they knew what his plans were, and I feel like a lot of people just wouldn't be comfortable with that. So they had to have taken him somewhere where he then could have gone off on his own, and he likely couldn't have gone anywhere far, and I feel like someone would have found his remains at this point. Um, I, it's just like one of those situations where did this person take him and just is all right with his choice, 
or did they take him somewhere and have no idea and he somehow managed to find another ride to the middle of nowhere where now no one has found his body. And also, if he planned to end his life, why did he take two to three weeks of insulin with him? I feel like if you're planning to end your life and looking at the case now and the length of time it's been, at this point I would assume he was successful, why bring something with you that extends your life and helps you live? I, I'm kind of caught up in that. And then why did he take his TV? Why did he take his sheets? Why did he take all of that money? You know, again, as I said, he could have bribed someone to take him somewhere with the money and the TV, and that I understand. But again, why didn't he take his glasses? Like, it just, it's like, why take these important things and then just leave this one other important thing at home? And then on the flip side, if he just wanted to run away, he knew that that simply was not possible for him. He had to have medical care. He had to have insulin. He had to have someone that could take care of him. He couldn't drive. He could barely walk. He could barely see and he left his glasses at home. He would not have successfully been able to maintain his life and maintain, you know, staying away because of all of these different factors that came to play. And then there are the other bizarre items that were missing, like his sheets and his TV. If you're going to run away to some random place in the mountains or just anywhere really, why would you bring a TV with you? And then why not just grab your comforter and your pillows? You know, he purposely took all these other things off of the bed to specifically just take the sheets, which is just very strange. So this leads you to believe that it was some sort of robbery or potentially an attack that left no blood behind, maybe a suffocation. But with an attack, why on earth would anybody take his crutches? Why would an attacker take his uh, medicine? Why would an attacker take all these random things like a flip-flop and a glove? All these things that he needed that were specific to him and of no value to necessarily anybody else other than the insulin. Why would this attacker take his sheets? It just, it doesn't make any sense. And the roommate said there was no sign of forced entry when coming into the home. So this 100% along with other things leads me to believe that if there was an attack, it was carried out by someone that he knew. Maybe not very well, but it definitely was someone that he knew. Maybe an acquaintance came over, one of the friends that he had met, and they didn't say anything beforehand because they knew they could just show up and he would let them in because that's what he always did. Maybe this person had other intentions. Bear was a perfect target. He was weak. He couldn't move on his own. He definitely couldn't move fast. And he had a lot of money and he had a lot of really nice things. And as a 20 year old surrounded by other 20 year olds that no offense could be very dumb and naive and see this you know, instant gratification of a big television and a couple thousand dollars as this great thing worthy of attacking somebody. You know, he was just such a perfect target. Being so open and giving to all of these different people that he met at the hookah bar could have come back to hurt him. You know, when it comes to an attack, he would have had to have opened the safe. I doubt the attacker was a safe cracking genius, so maybe they forced him to get up out of bed and told him to open up this safe and then took his TV and so he wouldn't say anything. Maybe they went on to hurt him. Maybe he suddenly tried to fight back, which to me, I, I don't know how he would act. I don't know his character. I don't know if he would push himself despite his illnesses and how weak he was to try to fight somebody off. Um, but either way, you know, you could have easily suffocated and killed Bear because of his weakness without leaving much signs of a struggle because he just couldn't move. And I know that sounds so horrific and morbid and I'm sure is breaking your heart just like it's breaking mine. It's just the truth. You know, authorities didn't find a sign of a struggle, but because of his state of health and physical abilities, that's not all too surprising and doesn't necessarily mean something didn't happen to him. 
He easily could have been wrapped up in these sheets. I think that makes a lot of sense as to why the sheets were gone and not just the blanket. Maybe he had been in bed and they threw the blanket off of him and yelled at him and demanded him to get up. He would have been holding his crutches to stay up. Maybe they pushed him onto the bed and that's how they attacked him. His crutches would be with him. So maybe they just wrapped it up with him. Maybe they took all of his personal items to make it look like he just ran away and they made sure they left with the things they came for to begin with. I mean, this seems like it could be far-fetched, but I do think there is a potential that that is a possible scenario. You know, he was letting so many people in that he might not have been able to trust as much as he thought. Despite whether it was an attack or someone maybe just helped him, either way, this person had to have known him. This person was someone that had been to his house before, knew that he had a safe filled with cash, knew that he had a decent amount of money, um, knew that he had insulin and where he kept it. They knew that he would be an easy fight. You know, I, I see this attack scenario. I know that personally his mother and family think that it definitely was a t an attack. I just struggle with it because of all the personal belongings that were taken. You know, some random person wouldn't have just so happened to take all of his most important belongings like his crutches and his backpack why would they have needed it you know and someone that didn't know him wouldn't have known to go to the barona reservation casino to me the barona casino could hold a lot of answers if he was running away why would he have gone to the reservation first why would he have gone to the casino i know that he gets checks there but i doubt they would sign a check for him early or you know at two in the morning when he was there. So I find that odd. And I also feel like someone would have reported seeing him there. But the only reason they knew he was there because of his cell phone ping. So why would he drive there, not get out of the car? What would he do around that casino? I feel like that could be a massive thing to look into. If someone had attacked him, you know, why would they have gone to the casino? Was Bear maybe in the car with him and they tried to drive him out there to get another check so they could just get more money and then when he couldn't do it, they just went and attacked him and left him somewhere? I know the family did hire a private investigator, but I have absolutely no idea if they still have one and I also don't have any idea how frequently authorities are receiving tips anymore. The time of night that he went missing is something that really bothers me because it was technically early hours in the Morning. It was between 1.30 and 2 a.m. and there's just not that many people out at that time and to me that really lessens the chances that someone saw something. I'm also concerned because the only thing authorities have to go off of are these cell phone pings but just because his cell phone pinged somewhere does not necessarily mean that he was with it. So had this cell phone just been dumped and taken on a little adventure first and Bear was potentially put somewhere else? they could be searching in all of the wrong places. Also, since the hookah lounge has closed down and I'm sure they have lost contact with a lot of people that he potentially could have been speaking to and potentially could have been involved if there is foul play involved. So it's just frustrating and I know you guys are probably just as frustrated as I am and I'm sure those theories and different scenarios and possibilities are seeming a little bit wild and a little bit jumbled but you know you've got to work with the information we have and so far the only thing that makes sense is that absolutely nothing makes sense. I really, really hope that his family gets some sort of closure because they are struggling so deeply. They lost the stepson, they lost the biological dad, they lost Bear, all within about a two year, not even two year time span. And I cannot even imagine having to go through something like that and then have no answers. It's scary. It is so incredibly scary. Bear was last seen wearing white basketball shorts and a gray sleeveless shirt and he had a bear claw tattoo on his inner left forearm. So please leave your theories down below. Is there another scenario that you can think of? Is there something particular in this story that seems significant to you? Maybe the belongings that were taken or the belongings that were left behind or maybe one of the areas the phones pinged. And I can't wait until you see the next video on Skylar Tossick to see if maybe you think these cases are potentially connected because Skylar's story to me is 
very, very different, but it could also take things a very different route in a way that I've yet to speak about on this particular video. So make sure you don't miss that. Make sure you get my notifications. A lot of you guys have had a hard time seeing my videos in your subscription box. So definitely hit the notifications and know that I post every single Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then every once in a while, I will throw in a Wednesday video. It's not very common anymore. I try to focus more on missing persons on Saturdays. But if I do post on Wednesdays, I post at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But I'm gonna go ahead and go, guys. Thank you for watching this video. And don't forget to subscribe to become a part of the Howland fam. So hopefully we can bring them home together. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.